Hi everyone, this is uh, Phil Travis here, and this is History 445 here at EOU, post-war Europe. Uh, this week we are reading from our textbook, uh, our jute book, chapter 8 and 9. We're particularly, these are the first two chapters at the beginning of the second section. We're particularly going to be examining the 1950s, uh, a period of, ironically, um, paradoxically, a period of like, um, pretty significant military buildup and military arms buildup, particularly in Europe, but yet one that also was met with a development of stability um, across Europe. And uh, so our, um, our readings deal particularly with um, issues like the issue of whether or not to rearm Germany, um, the issue with, uh, with, uh, with NATO, uh, with creating a European defense community, uh, with the development of nuclear weapons as well and their distribution across uh, Europe. We're also going to look at the Warsaw Pact or the Soviet Union a little bit this week. Uh, my presentation this week is on the Soviet Empire. And we're particularly going to look at um, uprisings as well in Poland and Hungary, which occur in the late 1950s within the Soviet Empire. And I want to look at these as two examples of sort of some of the problems with, um, with the Soviet Empire and why uh, reform after the death of Stalin uh, leads to violence um, in these particular areas. So we're going to look a little bit about at um, post-war Europe in the 1950s, and we're going to look at sort of the establishment of a more uh, permanent and militarized divide of Europe, and some of the issues within the Soviet bloc, um, as well as some of the factors for how uh, West German society develops, you know, as well, for example. Um, no quiz this week, just our usual discussion. Remember, make your first post by Thursday. I want to see activity, two replies, one post at minimum, and activity over two separate days for full credit, um, beginning no later than Thursday. Okay, um, so here's the factoid for this week. Uh, remember, extra credit factoid. Um, um, just email me this factoid no later than Wednesday by midnight. I'll give you an extra point on uh, one of our exams by the end of the term. Uh, so the extra credit factoid is this. Um, today, um, we still see the sort of, um, sort of oddity of um, having in Europe um, nations that do not own nuclear weapons, uh, but could have the ability to, to, to create them for their own, but yet possess them in their borders. Uh, so today, across Europe, there's five nations uh, that possess upwards, I think it's 150 uh, U.S. supplied uh, uh, nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, these weapons are in countries like Brussels, or I'm sorry, in countries like Belgium. <laughs> Brussels is the capital of Belgium. Uh, they're located in places like Belgium, uh, particularly Germany, um, Italy, um, the presence of these weapons is very interesting, and though know, it very much links back to what we're studying this week. Um, of course, France theoretically has nuclear weapons. Great Britain has its own nuclear weapons. Of course, Russia has its own nuclear weapons. The United States has its own nuclear weapons. But as we see um, the development and the need to uh, defend Europe and, and rearm Europe through NATO, uh, as we see that develop alongside the Warsaw Pact in the 1950s, there was, you know, uh, a belief held by many that nuclear weapons could be, um, you know, a real sort of ultimate tool in preventing um, a threat from Eastern Europe. So if you're in Western Europe, and, and vice versa. Um, and of course, at the same time, there was a great there was a great deal of fear from particularly the French at allowing Germany to rearm in its own right and or to develop its own um, nuclear weapons, which of course Conrad Adenauer had at one time briefly sought for Germany in the late 50s. And so as a result of this dilemma, um, the United States through, um, through NATO um, would provide um, weapons, which the Germans were trained in you know, the use and deployment of these weapons. But the United States would deploy these weapons across in these countries, countries that, like Germany, is a country that you know, absolutely could make its own nuclear weapons if it really wanted to. It has the resources, it has the know-how, but has repudiated that and has pledged that it will not do that. But yet, 
uh, despite that pledge, despite the fact that uh, you know even transporting uh, nuclear munitions across Germany is is uh, theoretically banned uh, because of NATO, the United States does store uh, some B sixty one nuclear bombs in Germany uh, that are designed as a uh, as a potential weapon to be used if there was a major war with the Soviet Union or with Russia uh, against NATO. Uh, and so the fact of it is this, that today there remain, I believe it's upwards of 50 B-61 nuclear bombs, it's something like that in Germany today, that while Germany denounces the possession and, and use of nuclear weapons, and these weapons are not owned by Germany, and Germany is not producing them, they are nonetheless maintained and stored in Germany, and if there was a major war um, against Germany, against NATO states, those weapons would be available to uh to the German Luftwaffe to use in uh, combat if, if, if it was a necessary decision made by NATO. Uh, so we have this interesting scenario where while France and Great Britain are nuclear nations, Germany is not, but yet through the United States there exists in Germany still to this day a relatively small amount of nuclear weapons um, in the instance that there could be a major uh, conflict uh, against NATO. All right, guys, let's have a great week. Uh, email me that factoid no later than Wednesday.